Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being with us again. So we're again reaching a global audience. So we want to shout out and say a big thank you to all the partners across the globe for promoting the webinars. Today, we are going to talk about the importance of acoustic room treatment to get you the best possible listening experience. We have four special guests joining us today. We have John Calder, Director of Retail Sales and Acoustic Geometry based in the East Coast in Minnesota. We have James <laughs> Lindenschmidt, who is a room designer and audio geek at GIK Acoustics based in Atlanta. We have Jeff Clark, Director of Software Engineering at Odyssey in LA, California. And we have our own Scott Orth, our own Director of Audio and Acoustics at Sound United in Baltimore. Welcome, gentlemen. Glad you can all make it. And thanks for making time for us. I am Frederick. I'm joining you from my evening in stormy Hong Kong. Behind the scene, we also have Jennifer Mash in San Diego and Jim Crowley in Minnesota. So we will be managing the flow of the questions. Hosting from his lovely theater home today is Phil Jones, our director in Carlsbad, San Diego. Take it away, Phil. Thank you guys for coming and taking this journey into sound. So um, I have a wide variety of, of, um, of, of people here and um, and I think that this is a very, very fascinating topic, but there's a couple of points that I want to stress before we even get started. Number one, this is a very detailed topic. So based on our response last week or yes, or the previous session, we will probably do more of these. So people are really fascinated about how sound works and how to make sound um, work well in their room. The next thing is there's solutions for everyone. We're going to be talking about some solutions that could be quite expensive and some just quick tips that you can do, whether it's rugs or heavy curtains or putting your subwoofer in the proper position that's going to help the acoustics in your room. So there's something here for everyone. We'll try to keep it basic at the beginning and then work our way up. Believe me, between Scott, John, James and Jeff, we got you covered if there's a technical question where you want to go, if you want to go there. But we're going to start off with, we don't want to blow everybody away with questions that are way up here. Um, let's first make sure everybody kind of understands the basics of sound. So, so let's get started. So the first thing we want to talk about is the fact that there is um, multiple ways to try to increase the performance of your sound system in your room. One way could be by you doing it electronically through something um, through electronic room compensation. And Jeff has been here a couple of um, several times to talk about the perspective of um, having a, uh, a electronic solution. And then there's also acoustic ways, ways that you can physically help change the characteristics of the way your room interacts with your speakers or moving your speakers so they interact better with your room. Now, the, a lot of times there is no a hundred percent solution that solves all issues. It's good to, ha to be have all the tools in your toolbox. So Odyssey does a really good job um, trying to work out the issues that you cannot um, correct by uh, by either placement or or room treatments. Because sometimes we have the decorating committee, and after a while, she says, "No more things on the wall," and no, you cannot put that speaker there. And and that's where the um, Odyssey comes in to make sure that we can um, that it get, you get the best performance. But if you look at Jeff's room, Jeff, what is behind you, Mr. Odyssey? It, yeah, well, um, we have solutions that work well uh, in a lot of cases, uh, and there there are some room problems that uh, many room problems that EQ alone won't compensate for entirely, or even very well, frankly. So these are acoustic diffusers. And what I have is a front wall and a back wall that are exactly parallel. And we'll talk more about that later probably, but that's a really bad situation. Oh, yeah. because they're both very <laughs> reflective and the sound just bounces back and forth. So if you snap your fingers, you hear it just ring back and forth. And, and these break up that reflection and improve intelligibility in ways that the EQ alone can't do. Yes, and later John will show you his high-tech tool to hear that type of effect a little bit later. But um, but the goal is to, to when you have something like 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 Odyssey, um, 
you uh, you want it to do the least amount of work as possible because you can only boost or or, or reduce frequency responses so much before um, it just cannot do it. If you have a huge dip, a huge black hole of bass in your room, adding more power and turning up your equalization more is not going to make that go away. So the goal is to make it as easy as possible um, for Odyssey. So James, this is actually um, something you sent me. Can you talk about what this is? Yeah, those are uh, spectrogram readings from a client of mine. Um, and uh, a spectrogram is uh, a way to look at audio data. It's a way to visualize audio data. And um, it's sort of a three-dimensional thing. Um, so the, 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 the bottom of the graph is sort of baseline. And then those streaks that sort of go up on the left graph, those are all, you can think of them almost like resonances in the room. Those are all the notes that are ringing. Um, and you can see like uh, on the left side with the bass response, there's a lot of them. And then the color of the spectrogram basically gives us the intensity. Um, for those who are familiar with a waterfall graph from test data, this is a similar way to look at the same data, but instead of looking at the waterfall graph where you have the everything coming forward in time, here it's like you're almost looking at the water graph from above, the waterfall graph from above, and it goes up instead of towards you. So it's 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 a useful way to very quickly get an idea of what the room does. Um, so what you're looking at there on the left and the right, those are before and after graphs of uh, uh, treatment strategies where um, I had a client who didn't have a huge budget. He's like, you know, basically I've got uh, I've got a thousand dollar budget, less than a thousand really. Uh, what's the best we can do? Um, so this is just what happened to his room when he just installed 12 of uh, uh, four inch absorbers, like our the uh, GIK 244s. Mm -hmm. So you can see what happened there. Um, the resonances throughout the audio spectrum got a lot better. Um, mostly on, uh, uh, above 100 hertz, that's where most of the improvement was, but you do still see some improvement below 100 as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a, that's a graph I like to use showing that, you know, you don't have to spend many, many thousands of dollars to get huge improvements in what you're hearing. Yes, so Jeff, which one of those would you rather start with? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're happy to start with the, uh, the, the second one and the, the better it starts out, the better it ends up. Yes, and the Absolutely. easier it is, and the less boost you have to have, and 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 there's and there's certain things such as and which we'll talk about um, that are phase and things like that that would be difficult. Now the next thing would be, of course, you have your electronic way of doing things, you have the acoustic way of doing things, but then you have Scott's team who are who work hard. They're, now there's technologies you can actually add to speakers to help try to work through some of these uh, issues um, through the speakers. Um, like what, um, different directivity and stuff like that, Scott? Could you talk about ways that yeah, uh, engineers? Yeah, that's right. I mean, well, you have to think of the, I always think of the room as being the last filter in the in the sound chain, right? And it's a big one. It can, as you can see from the graphs that, that were just shown, it's, it's a, it makes a big difference in your, in your presentation. So you have to know a little bit about your, your loudspeakers when you go about deciding what to do. Um, for example, in the low frequencies, you can you can do some uh, fixing of that low end just by moving some speakers around and uh, interact with the room in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then for the for the higher frequencies, it really kind of comes down to directivity and distance from uh, the reflecting surfaces and what they're covered with. So, so I'm going to have Scott come back later, and, and we'll talk deeply about even types of dispersion pattern um, patterns that come out of speakers, bipole, dipole. Um, line arrays, things like that, that they can, that and how they impact rooms, and how you could utilize how your speaker actually disperses sound into a room, and have uh, and utilize some of those tools to actually take advantage of stuff that you can't do with room treatment. The picture that I love is this one that I got from John, and this shows you that I don't care what kind of room you need, you have. There's there's a solution. There's sometimes a need, or a lot of times any room can be improved. So John, can you talk about this room? Uh, this was a highly problematic room. It's in New York City. It's called uh, Gotham Hall. It's an event center. Um, you know, millionaire weddings and um, Lenny Kravitz party for 300 of his best friends, things like that. Very high end events. And the room itself is the former Greenwich Village Bank. It's um, on the National Historic Registry for really good reason. It's a, an amazing, beautiful room. But it's all sandstone and it's an oval. 
which is about the third worst acoustic <laughs> geometry you can have <clears throat> behind circular and spherical. Um, so they had a lot of problems with echo, but the problem with an echo in a concave area is that it's focused. You think of a concave surface like a lens. It's an acoustic lens that focuses sound where you may not want it. In this case, right in the middle of the room, it had a reverb time of about five seconds. Um, and I determined that by using my There's acoustic this tool. generator, and yeah. that is a, an impulse generator. So that's that's what Jeff was talking about when he hits that. He hears that sound what nine times? <laughs> Isn't yeah, that crazy like that. So sound was reflecting around this room. We couldn't really change the physical geometry of the room, and so what we did is we built them some custom curved diffusers that are about four feet wide, and most of them are twelve feet high. There's twenty two of them in the room. Filled the backside with some um, recycled cotton absorption material. Covered them with a fabric that was an almost identical match with most of the sandstone in the room. We put them up. Nobody noticed they were there, first of all, but no complaints afterwards. They were inundated with complaints. Couldn't hear the mother of the bride speaking on the PA system. The band sounded terrible. Um, complaints stopped. And what this really shows is in an eight-story room with a dome and an oval shape and hard sandstone walls, you really don't need to cover every surface. You just need to redirect the sound. And in this case, it's smoothly diffusing it, um, causing uh, that lens effect to be far less. And, and so they, they really loved it. The room is now tame, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, will I, I will be a-, it's a um, perfect room now. Yeah, I will be, I can actually t be, give you a testimonial about this room. Um, I did a large event here for, for a audio product launch for another company I work for. It started with an S and ended with a Y, and <laughs> I used that room, and it sounded amazing, and I didn't even notice that it was treated, because we had all of our equipment in here, we had a big, we had, we had a band in here, we had a whole bunch of press in here doing demonstrations on audio quality from a variety of devices, TVs, sound bars, speakers, and I did not even notice that the room was actually treated, so that shows you how, um, how, um, how how you can get it into your room and still keep that design committee um, happy. There's lots of things that go on in your room. And, and the goal is, and we're going to talk about which one should you address first, because there's a lot of things you may want to address in your room, but certain things cause um, a lot of the, some of the biggest issues. So first we want to tackle those and then work our way down the line, depending on your budget. And then after that, you can, you can lean on Jeff's technology to try to do as much as he possibly can for, for the rest. So buy good speakers, place them properly, use it, um, use some sort of a, um, some sort of room treatments. And finally, at once all that is done, apply, you should, that's when you apply your, uh, your odyssey or your room compensation to get the most out of the room. So let's talk about how sound affects, um, affects the room. So first thing, James, you want to talk a little bit about the first reflection? Yeah, Actually, first reflection. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's uh, uh, first reflection points are an important concept to both increase the clarity of the system and also um, the uh, sound stage, the imaging that you're getting from the system. Um, so, you know, to sort of understand what's happening here, let's sort of imagine what happens in an untreated room, like shown in the bottom right of that diagram there. The green arrows are the sounds leaving the speakers and going straight into your ears. Um, sound travels a little bit more than one foot per millisecond. So that happens pretty quickly, almost instantaneously. Um, but then a few milliseconds after we hear that sound, we start hearing the red uh, arrows, which is the sound bouncing off nearby surfaces. Um, in this case, the side walls, but you also get early reflections from the ceiling and from the floor. Um, and those reflections aren't far enough back in time that we perceive them as a distinct echo. Um, instead, it sort of psychoacoustically uh, confuses our brains a little bit, our, 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 our nervous system and how we perceive the sound because we're hearing basically the same sound coming right from the speakers and then all the reflections. So it's the same thing coming from a bunch of different places. So localizing, you know, oh, there's the trombone is much harder 
when you've got it coming from all these other places. So when we get uh, treatments at the reflection points, the idea is to get rid of those reflections. All we want to hear in that first narrow window of time um, is the sound directly from the speakers, because anything else is just going to muddy that up. Um, so reflection point treatments are a way to, again, it, that's how it increases the clarity, because you're not hearing the same thing coming from different places. OK. OK, so, so John, are all reflections bad? Well, you know, that's I got dinged on that. Um, one of our videos, uh, which is called How Song Works in Rooms, the very first thing I say is flat surface reflections are bad. And then I went on to abbreviate that because when you're trying to do a shorter video, you don't want to add words. You want to take them out. <laughs> so I kept saying reflections. And somebody, uh, an acoustician actually, um, dinged me on that and said, you know, it, not all reflections are bad. Reflections are what help us understand our environment. I said, yes, you're right. But I didn't want to keep saying flat surface because it sounded redundant. So it is simply that flat surfaces reflect sound without reducing their intensity at all. But if you use only absorption in a room, you're going to end up with an anechoic space or you're going to end up with a, a room that is very uncomfortable feeling. And our brains really need some sense of the acoustics that we're in. And so we're really after just reducing it. We don't want to eliminate reflections. Um, we don't want to have the sense of only direct sound. That's what headphones are for. Um, but what we really do want to do is get the sound reflections, especially uh, first reflections, down 15 dB or so, 12 dB, 18 dB. If you go too much more than that, you start getting anechoic. Um, and so if you put absorbers in those spots or diffusers in those spots, you're going to reduce those first reflections enough that your brain can grab hold of whatever's coming out of the speakers and make a sensible image out of it. And, and it's a comfort zone for the brain. Okay, so let me ask Scott. Scott, is there a way that a speaker engineer can kind of limit, um, reduce the amount of first reflections a customer would hear based on a speaker's dispersion pattern? Sure, you can you can um, use dispersion. Uh, there's some downsides to using dis uh, dispersion to fix those, and that typically, if you're going to reduce the directivity or increase the directivity of the loudspeaker, you're also uh, changing the amount of sound power that's going into the room. So if I make a really narrow dispersion loudspeaker that's more like a laser than a floodlight, that's great. It'll send the the sound directly to the listener, and, and you won't get any bounces off the wall, and you might as well have an anechoic chamber, right? <laughs> so there's a there's a balance that has to be struck between um, what kind of sound power you're throwing into the room and and how much direct signal you're getting so that's uh you know it's a delicate balance and people choose to do it one one way a lot of it depends on how big the room is and what surfaces are in there if you've got a hard walled room and you can't do much with it well your last resort may be to resort to loudspeaker directivity yeah and and, and you'll see that you'll see that's why you'll see so many different designs of speakers because there's a there's a lots of different ways to for a speaker engineer to approach the um, how a speaker sounds in your room. Some go to something very directional, like a horn, to uh to uh to control that to try to control that first reflection. Some utilize the reflections um to add a sense of depth, like maybe. And we'll t when we come back and talk about definitive um focused um um our um forward focused bipolars and things like that. So there's a lot of different approaches on how do you utilize, how do you get the speaker to either um, to interact with the space. And there, and there's a lot, and, and, it, and, that, and each approach has its pros and cons. There is no perfect speaker design. There is no perfect acoustic treatment, everything. There's just different compromises and you try to choose the pieces that work best for you. Now, we say that these first reflections are the things that are the most important that we need to tackle. And uh, a lot of times people say, is there a formula? Is how do I do this? What's the best way to do it? And there's a simple way to do it. And all you need is a partner, a friend, and a, a mirror. If you have a friend in a mirror, there's this old school thing called the mirror trick. Um, James, you wanna talk about what the mirror trick is? Yeah, the mirror trick is just a good way to find where the reflection points are. You know, if we're gonna treat them, we need to know where they are. Um, so the way it works is while you're sitting in your listening position, you have your helper 
hold the mirror flat on the side walls and sort of slide it around the wall until you can see that reflection of the speaker as shown here. Um, and wherever the mirror is, when you can see the speaker in the reflection, that's your reflection point. Um, and that's a very useful real world way to find them. Uh, that's what I use mostly just, you know, or I mean, you know, if you're a pool player, you can sort of visualize the bank shot off the sidewalls and you pretty much know where it's going to be anyway. Uh, but the mirror trick helps you get it dialed in. You know, if you're a math person, you can also sit down and figure out the angles and calculate the geometry. You know, the no, angle of uh, no right, yeah, the the, no, the, the, no the angle of incidence is equal to the <laughs> angle of reflection. If you want to go that route, but yes. give me the mirror every time. I'll take that. That's much. Yeah, the simpler. mirror is a lot quicker. So yeah, right. so so take a mirror, slide around. Now, to get um, there is some things about it. So for example, if I have two speakers and I mm -hmm. how many uh, how many first reflections do I have on my left wall? You have one for each speaker, really. Um, and uh, a lot of times, like especially for larger like surround rooms, like like theater kind of setups, um, what I'll suggest is um, when you find a reflection point for each people, just mark it with a piece of tape or something temporarily, uh, just so you know where they all are. And then once you see where all the reflection points are, then you'll know, A, how big the panel has to be or multiple panels um, in larger rooms. And uh, you'll know exactly where to mount it to make sure all those reflection points are covered. Exactly. So, and um, and and our and John, are there just reflections on the walls? Oh no, oh no! What a nice lead-in. I feel like Johnny Carson doing. <laughs> um, actually, find them? we're fond of saying there's there's at least six. Most people have four walls, a ceiling, and a floor, and um, we tend to not worry too much about the floor. We've had people who wanted to put some of our diffusers on their floor, but um, it makes walking around a little difficult. And as you pointed out, the um, cushy. It's nice the, and cushy. Um, living <laughs> partnership, uh, the other half may not really want that. Yeah. But we really try and get people to think about the ceiling. Um, the ceiling is actually the largest unbroken, usually flat surface in the room. And flat surfaces, as we know, will return bounces almost full strength. So we try and talk people into in our case um, if they're really willing to go the distance find the first reflection points in the ceiling and put some curved surface diffusers up there they work terrifically well um, that works really well in recording studios where they're used to clouds over the console or something but in reality you can probably hang a couple of um, flat uh, absorber panels and that'll work pretty well but at least be aware that that's there um, one of the problems these days is people are building atmos speakers into their ceilings Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever the, the DBX, uh, DTX equivalent is. So you really need to be aware of, obviously, lights. If you're in a, a business, you need to worry about uh, sprinkler heads. You need to worry about ceiling speakers, but you can generally improve the sound just by putting a few cloud absorbers up. Okay. So, so yeah, so you got walls, ceilings, floors. Floors, many of you have carpeting, so you should be okay. Um, and that'll work from about 8,000 hertz up. Exactly. And, um, and then and then we'll talk about t ways to tackle it. But the first thing is when we're talking about first reflections and how to utilize them, do not do it the way Jeff does it. <laughs> yeah. What the heck, um, man? You're Ron supposed Jeff to use the mirror to find the reflection. The on the wall. I know reflection. What the heck is going on? We need to chastise yeah, rooms. So the, uh, the the reality of uh, you know a real room is that you don't necessarily get to choose uh, what you put where. So, <laughs> You know, if um, if you can't ha hang a, a diffuser there, because there's a mirror there, mm -hmm. you have to move on to some other solution. Yeah, make your cat sit there the entire time. Actually, don't you move your you move your don't you move your coat your coat thing over there sometimes too? That whenever you're playing music. I don't move it. No, <laughs> no. But the well, you, coats are yeah, they're there in the corner. You just go for the drone music where it really doesn't bother you much to have those reflections. <laughs> Hey, John or James, can you send this man a freestanding panel he can put on top of that? <laughs> Whatever he's playing, he can put on top of that. Please, please, we take, have care. You, take care of the electronic acoustic. I really like, I really like the art panels. I really like <laughs> those them, art panels. I think yeah, get him an art panel. Yep. <laughs> well, the last time we discussed a curved surface mirror, mirror but yeah. there was some disagreement that that would make you look really too <laughs> wide or really skinny, so we gave it up. Yeah. yeah. So this is not what we mean by yeah. finding the first reflection. Okay. Now, yeah. now when we talk about first reflections, 
and getting rid of them, we're, we're going to talk a lot about the treatments and the, the different types of treatments and things like that. But there's some poor man solutions for this or poor person solution for this, because I am a poor person as well. Um, first thing is curtains. If you can, like I have sliding doors on the left side of my room. They're very large. They're 12 foot sliding doors. And I made sure I have two rows of or two, um, I guess, curtain rods. And they both have heavy curtains on them. So when I want to play music, I close both of those curtain rods. I, I, and so I get a lot of, of, um, of fabric on that side. Is that as good as an acoustic treatment? No. But it, the room sounds a whole lot better than it did when I have the curtains, when I didn't have the curtains there. So there's things such as curtains, um, uh, rugs on the floor, um, uh, and things like that that you can actually utilize. Both James and John have very informative videos about um, how reflections work, um, how sound interacts in a room, and the products that they offer. You could really dive down in and see what type of solutions that work for you. Now, there's different ways to treat that first reflection. John, why don't you talk about absorption versus diffusion? Can you explain what those two are? Yeah, we're, we're, as we said, we're looking to reduce the energy of the reflection. Um, typically, when we talk about measuring absorption, it's measured in terms of sabins. How many sabins of absorption do you get? And the equivalent is a one sabin is roughly a one foot square hole in the wall. So obviously, a hole in the wall is not going to reflect any sound. And so we're, we're looking to reduce the amount of reflection. And the, the least expensive way to do that is to put up either a fiberglass or other material, um, usually a fiber-based uh, option, which is just a flat panel that absorbs some of the sound energy. Um, on the other hand, if you want, you can put a diffuser on the wall or the ceiling or the back or front wall. That also reduces the amount of energy arriving at your ears that would cause destructive interference from the direct sound. So either way will reduce the amount of energy that's causing the interference effects, one by absorbing it and the other by spreading it out evenly into the room. In our old office, they gave me the opportunity to build, to put together a theater so we can go in and play our great products, our Morant, Denon, Polk and Definitive products for um, new people that join our company. So we set up this makeshift theater up in a large room in our in our office but it was basically a big um drywall box so it was basically the sound was it was so many reflections going in it, it was it, it just didn't have a, it didn't sound very good so what we did was i went down to home depot and poor man solution they said you have a hundred bucks to spend <laughs> on on upgrading this room and i could go through and talk about the fact that we're putting $30,000 of equipment in here. And they were like, oh, you only have $100. Oh, well, by the way, if you're going to invest for high-end equipment, spend a little time to make the room sound good for the high-end equipment. Scott spends years building these things. The least you can do is make it sound good in your room. Okay. So anyway, um, so I went down to Home Depot and I bought pre-cut pieces of wood that are four inches thick by one, by one inch. So it's like four, it's like little slats. I made little boxes, little frames. And there's this stuff called rock wool. I mean, there's much better material, but rock wool kind of works better. You don't want to use the itchy yellow fiberglass, trust me. And one, it doesn't work very well. And two, you're not going to have a very good life when you're cutting that stuff. And I stuffed the panels with rock wool, and then I wrapped it with basically like a, was it what you call it, John? Burlap or can? Yep. Yeah, Cheap I wrapped it in burlap. Get what? Cheap you can get. And it's soundproof. Uh, a sound, it, it sound transfers through it. And I hung those. Hey, there's, there my, you go. there's my, my burlap <laughs> absorber in the back of my room. Oh, by the and way, you know, it stops smelling like burlap after about 15 years. You know, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I will know. And, and I hung those in the room and it made a dramatic difference in how the room sounded. But but I actually had a pair of GIK um, diffusers that we had just got for a trade show. And I actually swapped the uh, a couple of the absorption panels for diffusion panels and the stereo the sound stage got wider and the room got bigger when i was playing surround sound so there is you can't see differences as you move your way up a lot harder to build um diffusers john will tell you how to do one he's a crazy man but um but there are ways uh, but you can build this stuff 
yourself if you need to. Now, the funny thing about this, I'm looking, I have, I have stereo equipment behind me. Everybody else has acoustic treatments behind them. Wow. <laughs> My King Kong is a regular painting. So I wish that was one of those art panels, but everybody else has at least mm. a diffuser or <laughs> some absorption. But that's when you know you're dealing with a bunch of acoustical and acoustic engineers because <laughs> everybody has every room that's treated. And most of you guys are all musicians. So I'm surprised there's drums behind John. Uh, Scott has guitars. Yeah, I think I really, know. I'm, just, I'm just a drum owner. I, I'm not really. <laughs> I John own drums. Has... I own guitars. I can't claim to be. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Jeff has guitars. I think James. What do you do? You have any? Are you a musician as well? Or there's my <laughs> guitars. <laughs> it's like the cost of entry. Um, and then, but I think John threw down the gauntlet. Bam! With the gold record back there behind his stuff. So, so James. What would help you? How would you do? What are, what are some tips to think about whether it's absorption or diffusion? Do you experiment? Right. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, for, for me, it's all about balance. Okay. We want to have a balanced sound in the room and we want to have a good balance of different devices that help us achieve that sound in the room. Um, you know, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. So I, I don't want anybody to think that there's only one way that's correct and everything else is wrong, you know, because there's, I think for me, acoustics is almost as much about art and preference as it is about science and physics. Right. So um, for me, I the the reflection points in my designs in almost all rooms that's the one place in the room where I pretty much always want absorption as thick as possible for me um just because it was really early reflections in that early time threshold we were talking about earlier so yeah, I mean it, it depends on a lot of things but maybe let, let's go with 30 milliseconds any reflections that hit my ears within 30 milliseconds of the initial sound is not going to help what I'm hearing it's not going to help the accuracy so I want to get rid of those completely um so for me reflection points I always like to go absorption there um pretty much everywhere else in the room for me that's where i'll incorporate a lot more things you know you know different devices of diffusion um bass trapping um all of that stuff because really um you know we were talking about earlier about you know we don't want to turn our rooms into anechoic chambers anechoic chambers aren't easy to build <laughs> that's not going to happen by accident okay <laughs> You know, um, I, I, I do agree that there are some rooms I've heard that are too dead. They have too much high frequency absorption, but I'll even back up a little bit there. Usually those objectionable rooms that don't sound very good have too much high frequency absorption and not enough bass trapping and not enough diffusion. And that balance or, or lack of balance, that combination is particularly unpleasant sounding for me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so it, it really depends on what else is happening in the room, what's going on in the room. If you've got a really small 10 by 12 room like my office here, um, I'm going to tell you different stuff than if you have a 20 by 30 home theater, you know, with more space. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, different types of diffusion um, have different limitations that we can use um, um, or, or that might prevent us. Like I probably would not use much in the way of like QRD style diffusion in, in my room, just because you gotta be a certain distance away from those in order to avoid hearing artifacts and things like that. Um, and the other part of it for me is most diffusers that are, you know, at least the ones that I talk about, meaning they're small enough to ship economically, not really big things. Most diffusers work across a relatively smaller bandwidth than an absorber does, especially a nice thick absorber that reaches all the way down into the base. So, you know, something like, a, um, um, you know, like a, like a, a, a diffuser that's like, a, you know, six inches thick or something, whether we're talking about a QRD style diffuser or a, uh, uh, or, or, or like a, a, a poly diffuser, a curved surface diffuser, or things like that. Um, they're all going to have those characteristics, right? So for me, with reflection points, that's one of the most important places in the room to treat. Um, you know, for all the reasons we've already talked about. So I don't necessarily want a device that's only going to be active from. I'm making up numbers here, but. A typical diffuser might start kicking in somewhere between 500 hertz and 1k and then by say 4k or so it's not really doing much above that so it's 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 covering the critical mid-range the most important part of the range um, but it's not covering the whole range and so that's another reason for me why i like to use absorption at reflection points um, but again you know like uh, uh, john was talking about earlier the idea is to just uh 
reduce the energy of those reflections that we hear, those really early reflections. And diffusers definitely do that, you know. So depending on what else is happening in a room, you might go diffuse in there. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, there, there's different ways to do it. Now, John brought this up last time. Acoustics is kind of a newer <laughs> science compared right. to like mathematics has been around since like Aristotle or something like that. Right. So people are still learning. So if I yeah. ask all three of you how to treat my room, I guarantee you I would get mm -hmm. three different recommendations. Um, maybe but all of them, maybe more, but all of yeah. them would make a difference. Scott would say you should put them here or you don't even need right. those or, or move, move your damn speakers, you know? And then uh, John would say, we'll use this one and then a couple of these or, or this style. And James will say, you should do it this way. Now, all of these solutions can work. All of these solutions are going to benefit you right. as a listener. They, uh, it's just different approaches to science, um, but the goal and the, and the intent is the same, to make, to eliminate bad reflections in your room and make your room sound better um, to mm -hmm. reduce the amount of um, uh, base um, uh, uh, the, the dips in your room and, or knolls and make your room sound better. And there's a lot of different solutions. So, for example, um, uh, if uh, John, you offer both companies offer a lot. We're going to provide in the links their websites for all of their different things. But let me just give you an example. So, 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 John, why don't you talk about the, we've already talked about the absorption panel, how it absorbs energy. And then we were just talking about, um, uh, uh, James brought up the quad, the quadratic, quadratic residue diffuser, and then curved. And then there's, and depending on how much you spend, they get wider in frequency range, but they get way more expensive. So can you talk about what the, uh, what the difference is between a quadratic and a curve? Because we don't go too far, because we can get real okay. deep with it. Give me the well, and the, the, there's several types of diffusers. There are slot diffusers. There are um, circular hole diffusers. Those go on flat panels. Um, quadratic residues work with um, small resonant chambers that actually uh, resonate at certain frequencies based on prime numbers. And so the sound will resonate a little bit, come back out, recombine and um, cause the sound reflection to instead of being a straight reflection it'll it'll um be more diffuse it's uh, a, a phase disruptive uh, device and that's really good for some applications and for others it's not as good um, a curved surface diffuser is actually phase coherent and works generally depending down to the lowest frequency is the chord of the arc so the 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 width of the curved surface diffuser is generally at half or quarter wavelength is as low as it'll go. Um, and so there's a number of different diffusers available. And one of the, I wrote a blog once that people reacted interestingly to said, just get a bunch of um, marble statues in your room. Get some marble <laughs> columns and cherubs and angels and you know, you just get some sculpture in there and it'll actually bounce sound around kind of like a uh, 14th century concert hall. Now what we're really know. after doing, depending on where we put these in the room, um, I typically say put a curved surface, a cylindrical phase coherent diffuser in your first reflection points. And except for the back of the room, often people will elect a quadratic residue type because what happens in, in reflections once they die down a little bit and after they've gone on for a while, they turn from echo into reverberation. And one of the studies uh, done by a really smart guy in Brazil or Argentina has the effect saying, if you substitute noise in the tail of a reverb chain, it's, it sounds exactly the same. And so what we're trying to do and make the room sound bigger, often if, if the back wall is a problem, you can put something that is more of a chaotic um, diffuser. Whereas in a first reflection point, um, we found, I've found just through experience that the, the cylindricals work really, really well in enlarging the sound field, making the room sound bigger um, and causing less disruption. But that's somewhat controversial. And so you'll get a lot of people that say, you know, put absorbers in those first reflection points and th that's totally fine. It really depends on your room. The smaller the room, the more diffusion you're generally going to need because what you've done is now the resonances of the room, the modes, are higher in frequency and start getting into the mid-range of the sound. 
So we generally say, if you've got a, a huge room, you may not need much of anything except for some uh, base absorption. But otherwise, it really depends on the space and the geometry. If it's a rectangle, it's an L shape, if it's a box. Hence, hence there is no one solution for everyone. No. Now, mm. as Brad Pitt says, John, what's in the box? What's in that curved thing? What's in the box? What's in the box? Um, we, we used to make these um, when I was first given advice on our the studio that we built in my basement, which is this is part of it. It's still a studio <clears throat> 30 years ago. Um, the late Vincent Van Half, who was a buddy of mine, said, well, and this is your DIY tip. Go out and buy some concrete column forms, which yep, are the go big get it. laminated. <laughs> yep, you just got one. There it is. That's a small one. Yeah. He said, buy a two foot diameter concrete column form, cut it into thirds, not quarters, not half, thirds. And then put some fiberglass in the back or whatever, coats or whatever you've got, and then hang them on the wall and put them, spread them out. And it worked so well in our tiny little studio space that I went on to um, later suggest to Acoustical Surfaces, which are a parent company, that we should build these. Nobody was offering uh, cylindrical diffusers at the time. Um, polycylindrical diffusers had been in use for 80 years. So we went on to build these. This is the second iteration in this picture. It's in a curved aluminum with a L bracket on the back. Um, that holds a mass-loaded vinyl membrane, which is also a low-frequency absorber. And the inside is filled with um, recycled cotton absorption. And so it's a smooth aluminum surface that reflects uh, or spreads out sound all the way up to about eight or 9,000 hertz. And the back is a low-frequency absorber from about 200 hertz, 300 hertz down. Um, and we find the mass-loaded vinyl works really, really well when it's in a pressure zone, which is up against a, a, a surface, a wall. But these are premium products. These are not- Yeah, they're not cheap. <laughs> yeah. Building, so building two of those cost more dangerous. than all the, actually one of those probably costs as much as all the treatment chains put in that room, you know, for that person's, for that person's budget. So like I said- yeah, they're about 450 bucks each retail. Yeah, there's, there's different levels. And by the way, um, they're, uh, if you look behind Jeff, those are also, those also are, quadratic residue diffusers. If you look at the, the slat looking one um, in the picture, that is made out of wood. Jeff, what are yours made out of? Uh, these are styrofoam. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah. They're still freaking yeah. expensive. They're still expensive styrofoam, but they're, they're just styrofoam. Yeah, and but by the way, that isn't some guy just randomly cutting links of stuff. Because I see people do that. I'm gonna make my own and randomly cut pieces of wood, and then they look really pretty, but they they probably don't work. There's some like this. We'll go into the prime number thing in the Q and A later. But there's maybe. some science, but maybe believe me, with this group, we're gonna go down that rabbit hole. I'm sure. Probably, but um, yeah. but there uh, but there's different, but there's science behind all the the links of those. The, the depth of the slats on the, if you look at that, uh, of the wood ones, they're both there. The best way to think about Jeff's room is say I was shooting a gun and you know how bullets ricochet? When he fires, the the speaker fires the bullet, it just ricochets off the wall back and forth continuously. So he, so it's like, it's, it's just doing this until eventually it, the bullet just runs out of energy and falls on the ground. What those do is the bullet goes, hits the wall, instead of ricocheting back, it goes bing and it goes over there. So, so or it gets basically hits and it shatters into like a whole bunch of little pieces to stop that ricocheting going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So that's why he has them behind him in his particular, in his particular space. So you were saying, Jeff, you actually have them in the front of the room as well? Yeah, they are, there, there are a couple of them. Um, I actually could use more of them. There's still a lot of open space that is, is still uh, creates that same reverb, but it's reduced. Even if you don't get an exact first reflection damped down a little bit, you're gonna, it, it's gonna reflect into your treatment at some point. And a lot of times, really what we're talking about is just make a, an improvement, make it better. There is a, a, a balance to it. Even if you go to the theaters or you go look at a high-end home theater room and it looks like there's fabric all along the room, that that stuff is sound transparent and behind that is the speaker so you can't see them and room treatments in certain positions so the whole room is not a big absorption thing it's it goes through there and you may have diffusers and and um 
and uh, and um, absorption all over the place. And of course, the, the all of the audio engineers will fight. Like even when I asked Scott, what am I going to put in this hotel room? He's like, let me tell you, go get two of these, and two of those, and don't put that there, and don't put that there, because everybody has their their own um, idea, and it all it usually works because it's all it's a new science, but it is based on science. So so let's continue on. Yeah, if you go look at both uh, the the uh, uh, the JI, the JIK and the acoustic uh, acoustic geometry, I think John has a a video with like over a million views, a million two about how sound works and he uses props like ping pong balls and lasers and string to show you how I'm trying to do lasers. <laughs> yeah, not lasers 